I've, I've often been asked by people, if we actually do find something out of a psychic nature, do we ever do anything about it? Now, the simple answer to that, I think, is basic answer, rather, is no, not usually. We're only concerned with trying to accumulate evidence, and we don't really feel that there's any point in trying to interfere with something that's, well, almost natural. Or I know some people describe it as supernatural or preternatural. But the answer to that question would be basically no. We just want to acquire some evidence. Yes, there's one difficulty when trying to accumulate evidence. Say that again. With trying to accumulate evidence is that nowadays with all the modern technologies such as Photoshop and all the rest of them, Photographs are very, very easy to fake. That's why, quite honestly, I preferred investigations in, shall I say, my, my old days when we used... Yes, we used night vision, but we used basically black and white cameras when they were much more difficult to fake negatives and that sort of thing. I never... I've never personally faked any, <laughs> any photographs. I didn't want to give that impression. But a lot of it has been done. I've seen films videos on, on the TV and I've been shown films privately where you can actually see a moving image and you would actually think it's a ghost mm. when it's just a fake. The, we're not in the business of faking, yeah. we're just trying to find the reality. Because of that very fact that that is all the faking which can go on, it's much harder to sometimes convince people if you do actually get a genuine photograph. Uh, I myself have one or two photographs only um, which have, I can safely say, are unexplained. One was on a so-called haunted lake near Welling Garden City, which is only some 30 miles north of Muswell Hill. And we were spending a vigil on a very cold January night, and in the middle of the night, about half past three, rather in the morning, we distinctly saw a tall shape of, it appeared to resemble a lady. It looked to be about eight feet tall, in the middle of the lake and it was floating across the water. Now I had a photographer with me and he immediately took a shot of it but he didn't really have time to do much more because this really only lasted for about three or four seconds but we all distinctly saw it. Then it just it vanished. Well obviously the first thing we we thought was in the morning we've got to investigate a bit more could it have been some sort of mist? Could it have been an underground pipe, maybe, of hot water, which is reacting with the lake? We didn't know, but we definitely got a picture of that white apparition. And when the negative was developed, it was entirely blank. All the other negatives that we'd taken in and around the, or the manor house, because there was a manor house next to the lake, all the location shots were perfect. They all came out, but that particular place uh, that particular negative was completely blank. So I'm afraid people would just have to draw their own conclusions from that. But that wasn't a fake. Yeah. I first became involved in, shall we say, the paranormal um, many, many years ago. I was very young, actually. I, I, I was 10, 11. And my mother was involved in the spiritualist church. And now she used to go to meetings locally, Muswell Hill and Finchley. And it's also a place in Kentish Town. She used to attend spiritualist churches. And I think I was greatly influenced by her because she had a very spiritual outlook to life. Whereas my father was completely the opposite. He was a very... He was a good man, but he was very... Uh, he didn't believe in the supernatural. He didn't even really believe in God. And this often caused a lot of conflict between them. Um, but basically I can say that I, I, I came under my mother's influence a great deal. She taught me a lot about, explain, not taught. She taught, she explained a lot about the spiritual world. Even our house was supposedly haunted. We used to hear an audible voice there in one of the big front rooms in, um, in Shepherd's Hill, Highgate. And on two or three occasions when I was very young, I actually glimpsed a figure in the corridor there and it was, my it was my mother that explained to me 
that you shouldn't be frightened of these things. Sometimes they've got a net, very natural explanation, even if it is a psychic one. And she, she, she explained a lot about the nature of, if you like, ghosts, unexplained apparitions, the movement of objects, all the sort of things which would normally are what terrify a young child. And they did frighten me to a degree, but not after she explained their possible occurrence. I never attended the spiritualist yeah. church in Muswell Hill with my mother. Yeah. I, di I didn't attend any. She, she went to one in North Finchley. Yeah. She went to one in Kentish Town. Um, I, I was too young to actually attend the churches with her. Um, and so in that respect, I'm not sure where all the churches were. were. I know one was in North Finchley. And I know that she used to attend one in Kentish Town. And she used to go to the, all three different churches with her friends on different, on different occasions. This, of course, was in the very early days. Um, unfortunately, my mother died when I was only 13 years old, which is quite a young age, I suppose, to lose a parent. Um, I rebelled against school, especially after she died. I just refused to learn anything, and I saw school as being completely materialistic. I wasn't interested. The, the only subject, ironically, that I was any good at, in fact, I came top of the class, was scripture. That did interest me, although it might sound slightly ironical from reading some newspaper reports about me sometimes. But anyway, th th that was my top subject. I rebelled against school. I did not accept the materialism. Um, but when I left school, I, I, I was very young, I was only 15. I went travelling around Europe for a short while, getting whatever jobs I could find. Um, ended up in Sicily. I was working in a hotel. It was the off season, so I was quite lucky to get a job. I came back when I was 16, 17, and I spent a short time at, at spent a short time at drama school. I only hesitate because one of the first plays I was ever in was called The Dark of the Moon. And I was playing the guitar in it. Well, it didn't have a big part. But the whole point is that was that was a play about witchcraft in America in the nineteen twenties. And it was sort of symbolic of the way the witch hunt was still going on in modern times so it was a very interesting play at the same time I, I I sought out a friend of my mother's her acquaintances that attended the spiritualist church and through them I met other people and I went to the houses I spoke to them and eventually I, I was introduced to a lady who lived in Barnet who's, who's now obviously passed on she passed on in 1977 and her name was Helen. Now she was actually involved in Wicca, which is very similar to spiritualism, at least the basic tenets are the same. Um, it's, a, it's a fertility religion. It's based on understanding the powers, forces in the universe and in nature. And forces which are there, which we can all utilize, but most people ignore when they don't know how to. And there's a series of training and rituals and initiations which can actually advance you in understanding these forces of nature. Uh, as I said, it's called Wicca. That is the real name for it, which I, I believe comes from the word wise one. And in the Middle Ages, when the church, or sorry, in the days of early Christianity, uh, Wicca was taken over by the early church and it became known as witchcraft. And hence you had all the witch persecutions of the Middle Ages and the Spanish Inquisition and um, because the early church were generally, gen generally trying to suppress what they saw as the old religion. Sorry. And the early church were generally trying to suppress what they saw was the, well, it was the old religion, and they were trying to take over, take over its customs and rituals, and so sort of utilise them into the Christian faith. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Can I give you an example? Yeah. I mean, in the old, in the old religion, Christmas—that's the winter solstice on uh, 
December the 21st was symbolised by holly and it was symbolised or by mistletoe holly being symbolic of everlasting evergreen everlasting life now when the Christian church attributed that date to the birth of Christ to the, in fact in reality scholars agree he wasn't that Christ wasn't actually uh, born until the end of the January but that, 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 that's a mute point the church took over the symbols of mistletoe and holly and used them to celebrate the birth of Christ and again at the old Wiccan ceremony of Easter that was originally a fertility rite in, in April and it was symbolised by an egg and the church came along and conveniently borrowed the symbol hence we have the Easter egg a lot of the Christian ceremonies and rituals were actually based on much older traditions um, there's nothing really wrong with that because I'm not anti-Christian in any way um, neither incidentally am I ever now involved in Wicca mm. that's another story but after many years of being involved in it I finally decided well I don't need all the symbolism I don't need the candles I don't need the pentons, pentacles I don't, I don't need the altars but I actually left my old Wiccan altar in my flat in Highgate and it was there for many years uh, and it was all covered in dust and I left it there because it, I used to I still saw many 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 people involved in Wicca and they used to visit me and to them it was a form of consolation yeah. uh, they, they could still identify with me being involved in the actual religion whereas I actually left Wicca permanently in 1982 mm -hmm. And the reason I left was that, this is not meant to sound arrogant, but I really felt it had taught me all I knew, and I'd gone beyond it. I no longer needed the symbolism. Um, I no longer needed the security of having to reach out to outside deities or outside spirits. I'd come to understand that sometimes that's just not necessary. My first encounter with the paranormal such as really the, the house I was born yeah. in in Highgate in Shepherd's Hill a lot of strange things yeah. happened there as I said to you but even at that early stage we were even as a child I remember joining up with other children in the area and we used to explore haunted houses um, I remember once there was a story in the Hampstead and Highgate Express this was oh, I must have been about 10 or 11 about a haunted house in Hampstead Lane, which was just past Target Village. And it was lived in. And as young children, we all were really excited and we went up and we were, I think we knocked on the door and it asked about the stories of the ghost. Well, oh, just as kids do. I mention that because that's one thing we never do nowadays. If a house is haunted, we don't immediately contact the people because it could frighten a nervous or superstitious person. I mean, you wouldn't be doing them any good. That's why we wait until they're contacted. But as young children, we used to go around to so-called haunted houses and try and witness something, try and see the local ghosts in the area. Um, and that's how it all started. I don't really know that much about local history. Although I was born in Highgate, um, it might sound a bit ignorant to say that. I mean, I do know a few basic things which relate to the paranormal, which yeah. I are important for me to know. One of those things is that, actually, I should just say that many psychic phenomena are associated with ley lines. Now, ley lines are lines of energy which run across the Earth's surface. And in much older times, they often join together um, sacred stone buildings or churches and they were marked often by stones or stone circles and we've discovered a, l a great percentage of cases of unexplained phenomena actually occur along the course of ley lines now don't ask me why it's probably to do with conducive to some energy in the earth itself but that 
is a fact from a psychic point of view. And it is also a fact that there's quite a large ley line runs from here in Muswell Hill, this is Muswell Hill Road, right through to um, th through Highgate and onto Highgate Cemetery, where it connects with the Circle of Lebanon, right in the centre of Highgate Cemetery. And um, actually, to be more precise, the line starts or ends, whichever way you look at it, at the Circle of Lebanon Highgate Cemetery. It then passes through the Flask, a public house, which is a very old coaching inn. It then passes through the Gatehouse pub. It then passes on through Highgate Woods. Um, the, I'll go from the Gatehouse because I missed out the important one. It then passes the Gatehouse pub, which again is a very old pub setting from the 13th century. It then passes on to a large black of, block of council flats known as Hillcrest in North Hill. And it then goes on through Highgate Woods and is marked by an old Roman settlement which was excavated, I believe, in 1967 and they found pottery fragments and arrowheads there. So it's quite an important community centre at that time. It then appears to go on through St Luke's Hospital. <coughs> but the problem is, when tracing many ley lines, Buildings have been demolished, or they've been cemented over. Um, so very. having said that, many old buildings were built upon the sites of much older buildings. It's, I'm still very interested to try and find out what stood on the site of St Luke's Hospital before St Luke's was built on it. And also then I would like to try and find out if there was any very ancient supernatural activity which, which might be reported somewhere which has not yet come to light. But on the point of ley lines, there is, of course, well, it's well known, there is a tall black clad figure which has been seen in and around by many local people at Highgate Cemetery. Now, the interesting thing is that in the flask, there have also been reports of a tall black figure, often seen around an old bench there, I don't know if it's still there, called the Old Monk's Bench. Glasses have been known to shatter, lights go on and off, um, and bottles fly off shelves, and there have been drops in temperatures. I understand that activity is still going on, at least it was about a year ago when I, when I went up to the pub to speak to the manager. Now in the Gatehouse pub there have again been reports of a tall dark figure which actually frightened some staff so, so much that they actually left. They left the pub. Very similar things, drops in temperature, tall dark figure being seen, um, bottles falling off shelves and so on. Where the line crosses North Hill, the, the council flats, Hillcrest. Now the interesting thing is that Hillcrest used to be, it was rather was built upon the site of an old Victorian convent, um, which was which served as a, which which was run by nuns and housed unmarried mothers, which was quite an important thing in those days in Victorian times. That sort of thing was frowned on, and there had again been reports in one of the flats there on the ground ground floor, which I personally investigated and spoke to the residents, of a tall dark figure seen in one of the rooms. There were drops in temperatures. The bell used to ring mysteriously at night. There was a sound of footsteps, and these, these were not only heard but by the man and his wife, but by their three old children independently. I understand they called in the local priest to perform some sort of exorcism in the flat. And in fact, well, that actually made the matter worse. Um, it didn't help, and things actually got worse, whether it aggravated the psychic activity. I don't know, but there's also been reports from other people in the in, on the estate of a tall, dark figure that's been seen fleetingly in the grounds. Now, so much for Hillcrest, but where the where the ley line crosses the old Roman settlement in Highgate Woods, 
there have been quite a few reports, mostly from dog walkers, uh, because the actual settlement itself it isn't in uh, a populated part. It's at the top of a sort of an isolated hill. But people nevertheless walk their dogs around it or over it, and there have been reports of a tall, dark figure. Um, one man reported to me called, I think his name is Mr Layden, he was walking his Alsatian dog, and the dog immediately stopped and his bristles went up and it started to growl. And then he looked at what the dog had seen and he saw a tall, dark figure standing by the tree, an old beech tree, which just disappeared mysteriously. I'm only giving those examples because to try and illustrate that there could be some possibility uh, that psychic phenomena are definitely connected with these lines of energy, hence the tall dark figure uh, reported to Highgate Cemetery. It could just be the same figure which is being seen at different locations along the ley line. In fact, I personally think that's highly probable. There are certain ways of, if you like the word, or tracking ley lines. You can there are psychic ways by employing a, a psychic medium or you can even even use the dowsing method. But probably the easiest way, and the one I use most, is, is the knowledge that many ancient sites were built upon the course of these ley lines. The ancients used them as some sort of map because they had power in them. And obviously the easiest way to track, and it's obviously easier in the country, is to find reports of psychic phenomena and if we suspect it's on a ley line which we invariably do a lot of these ley lines were built in precise direct alignment and you can actually follow the course of a, li a line much easier in the country by just following it along the various alignments which lie upon it another important factor as well as ley lines which can possibly explain the appearance or manifestation of some forms of psychic energy, apparitions, entities, ghosts, is the fact that often when building work takes place in a building, and I'm talking here about just heavy structural work, not a coat of paint, not maybe putting a door on, I'm actually talking about when walls are knocked down or the configuration of the building is significantly altered you often find the spates of psychic activity indeed this happened at the gatehouse when they were doing renovation work and this tall dark figure was being seen and it certainly ha has happened at Highgate Cemetery even recently as recently as two or three years ago when heavy building work was going on in one of the houses there it seems to somehow release psychic energy although it somehow in some way we don't understand, psychic energy actually becomes entrapped in the stone. If you interfere with that stone, significantly interfere with it, you can release the psychic energy and hence you have another spate of psychic activity. Now this happened in the gatehouse as I said. It happened at Highgate Cemetery when the reports started up again in 2005 about a tall dark figure being seen there. And it's happened in many other local pubs too, where heavy structural work has gone on. One of them being the King's Head in, in Crouch End, where a ghost has also been reported, and where, behold it or not, they were demolishing or removing a cellar in place of a ballroom, or vice versa, or something like that. So there, I think personally there's definitely a connection between psychic activity and heavy renovation work sometimes done in a particular building. People have often asked me or rather pointed out to me that Alexander Palace has had a string of bad luck since it's been even in recent times was I believe the fire was there in that there were, well I know there was a fire there I believe that was only in 1980 81 or something like that. Um, I haven't in actually looked into the possibility that the palace could have been constructed on a ley line. It would be an interesting thing to look into. Um, 
then again, having said that, you can also have negative ley lines and you can have positive ley lines. Negative ones being obviously lines where the energy is very sort of malign, malignant. And if that is the case with the palace, it would certainly explain some of the bad luck that it's had over the years. Yeah. If there is extensive... This work doesn't only apply to... What I've been referring to doesn't only just apply to buildings. It, it applies to vast areas such as roadways or council proposal plans to knock things down or rebuild things in their place. There's been a lot of that activity in Muswell Hill over the years. Um, Muswell Hill is now a very trendy and elite area and in order to get to that stage there's been a lot of building and a lot of, a lot of if you like, diversion to get people to it and all that sort of thing. Um, when people ask me why is maybe this particular building haunted and not that one that is a very difficult question to answer um, the common conclusion by people is that it's haunted by a spirit and the spirit may have happened to have died in the particular house therefore the spirit has remained earthbound and is haunting the building I'm not so sure about that I think psychic energy can lay harboured in buildings for many centuries and it's dependent on not only a recent family living there but people who may have lived there in the, in the past the impressions, the emotions the lifestyles when those people have died obviously all that's gone and I think it's highly conceivable that sometimes that can remain in a particular building depending on its potency yeah. I've mentioned the famous case of Highgate Cemetery Indeed, I did, I did so when mentioning the ley line. Um, Highgate Cemetery Highgate Cemetery is a very old, well, it's 1835, I believe, but it's a very old Victorian cemetery. Very Gothic looking. Well, not looking, it is Gothic. Um, it, it contains vaults, it contains tombs. And at one period in its history, I'm talking about the... the mid 60s it had been neglected to such an extent that there was a uh, horrendous vandalism going on there tombs were being broken open uh, coffins smashed open crosses knocked over um, and people just going in there for kicks that's what it was like and I, I, I remember it well in those early days um, it was very overgrown you could easily get lost in there if you didn't stick to the main paths. And eventually and eventually, it was taken over by the Friends of Highgate Cemetery, I believe in 1975. Let's, let's face it, they have done a marvellous job there. They've really tidied up the cemetery, they've cleared the pathways, they've cleared the tree roots out of dangerous places. They've received some criticism for charging too high an emission there I hear they've put the price down because they came under the, they took notice of that criticism that I'm not sure about but the old cemetery is still open to the public but only on guided tours basically Highgate Cemetery has always been reputed haunted and even in the late 60s amidst all this vandalism people were reporting seeing this tall dark figure inside the cemetery or outside the cemetery actually in Swain's Lane um, I trace these reports back to the Victorian era actually at that time there was a tall dark figure that seemed that used to disappear mysteriously through the cemetery wall and that was in Victorian times this figure was often described as, as wearing a tall hat too now, whether there was a, a gateway in that section of the wall at this particular time, I don't know. But it was reported as early as Victorian times. Um, and then, of course, around that period, of course, we had the Bram Stoker connection, who came very close to describing Highgate in his book Dracula. So 
almost certainly possible that he would have heard about all these reports of this tall dark figure. But in more late in the late sixties the reports were still happening. Um, as it was local, I lived in Highgate, I actually decided to go to the cemetery myself one night and this was in December 1969. Now the reason I went there was to try and look for some logical explanation. I went at night because this is when the figure had been mostly seen. I was looking for maybe I thought People had seen the tree branch moving in the wind with the moon reflected behind it that it cast a shadow out into the lane, something like that. I knew there were animals brooding in the cemetery, foxes at that time. I look into the possibility that foxes being nocturnal, someone could have been mistaken and they've got a most piercing bark, it can almost sound a bit uncanny. Whether these things could have maybe being confused with the apparition that had been seen there. Now I was approaching the top gate of Highgate Cemetery from Highgate Village and as I passed it I caught something out of the corner of my eye and it seemed to be a tall dark figure standing just inside the top gate. Um, by this time there had already been rumours and stories about a vampire in the cemetery. And the very first reaction was I thought, oh, it's somebody dressed up in a black cloak trying to frighten past a spy. But it wasn't. What I saw, it appeared to be floating above the ground, meaning you couldn't actually see the bottom, it just dissipated to impenetrable blackness. But as you looked up, it was highlighted against the more the sky and it appeared to have red eyes. Now whether this could have been light reflecting from houses in the background in the distance, I don't know, but th that was my impression. Um, whatever it was, the area, and I do remember this, turned icy cold, and it was a bitterly cold night, so that's really saying something. It was like really putting your ha hand right inside the ice box of the refrigerator, it was all around, and it was, almost unbearable and after about four seconds maybe even less but it seemed like an eternity the figure just wasn't there it had gone and it was that that made me decide to uh, initiate a full-scale investigation into this entity now I, I'd actually seen it myself I was in no doubts that something was there I didn't know what it was I just put it down to maybe an earthbound entity which has somehow been trapped to the earthly plane and um, we had people up in Highgate Cemetery in pairs at night uh, in taking their turns um, with cameras trying to get some photographic evidence one of these actually saw something out of the corner of his eye a tall dark figure in there one night um, I wrote a letter to the local press I believe it was the Hammond High um, asking for information from local people and about the sightings of the figure and quite a few people replied it in various newspapers that they witnessed the same thing. Um, as a matter of fact my letter to the paper um, avoided, very carefully avoided mentioning vampires because I didn't want to frighten people, I just wanted information about people who might have seen this apparition. Um, the paper as usual predictably got it wrong. They, they quoted me as saying that a tall dark figure that I had seen on three occasions. Mm -hmm. I did not say that, I said in the paper a tall dark figure that had been sighted on at least three occasions which it had at that st stage. Anyway, that, that's just a minor point. A lot of people came forward and verified that there, that there is some ghost in and around Highgate Cemetery. Um, f once it became published in the newspaper, of course, the site 
psychic activity, or should I say the reports about psychic activity, increased. Now this could have been due to a lot because often by genuine people who might have read in the paper there's a ghost there or a vampire there or a tall dark unearthly figure there and actually seen something quite innocent because they'd read about it in the newspaper. And it's always a difficulty to try and sort out who's exactly, shall we say, genuinely telling the truth. That is, they're not making it up, but it, what they saw wasn't really paranormal. With people that have actually genuinely seen something. And then also you've got the difficulty, there are some people who come forward and just invent something. And which is not too difficult to tell either. But if you are an experienced investigator, you can in fact, you learn by instinct how to tell. I mean, there was an outbreak, to come back to that again, in Highgate Cemetery, following the building work in 19, sorry, 2005. There were quite a few reports from completely genuine people that might not have actually seen anything. But I actually spoke to one lady, and she was with a friend, and there's a, she described it as a terrible atmosphere, just as she left the cemetery in Swain's Lane, it was overbearing, and it was almost suffocating, and he experienced it too. And also there's been a lot of interference by different people with mobile phones there. They suddenly cut out for no apparent reason. So that I'm sure there's some energy active up there and I'm sure it, start, it started up again when this it coincided with this building work in 2005. A common question to me is <clears throat> you saw the figure you reported as seeing the figure in the press you were interviewed about it on the television which I was Do that again. <laughs> you were interviewed on the television about it as I was so how come how is it you became branded as a vampire hunter well, I'm forever explaining this. I am not a vampire hunter. I am a psychic investigator only. How I became one, well, I didn't become one. How I was described as one was because one night following my sighting of the apparition, about five of us went to Highgate Cemetery with the intention of performing a psychic seance. That is trying to make communication uh, with the entity using a psychic medium to find out what was its purpose and if it was really earthbound. We had implements with us. Um, we had small crosses, small Celtic crosses. I had my camera, a portable tape recorder. We had candles, we had incense. The idea was to sort of, and I, very importantly, I had a stake, but attached to the stake was a piece of long cord. The idea of that was to try and cast a magical circle on the ground and all this started to take place at the top on a flat piece of land of the Circle of Lebanon. The next thing we knew, the police were approaching. We, well, we, it didn't take too much intelligence to realise it was the police because they were shouting and speaking loudly and they had flashlights. Now we had two cars parked at the front of Faggett Cemetery which should come by and these people, other people moved away from the police because they were still quite some way off. They could get back in their cars and get out, out of the area, yeah? Not that they were doing anything wrong. I headed to the right of the police because I knew people that lived in South Grove who lived in the big house there and its garden backed onto Highgate Cemetery and I thought if I can just get into that garden I'd be perfectly safe because if the people in the house catch me they know me anyway they, they wouldn't mind uh, I, I intended to leave via Highgate Village and just walk home I got caught by a flashlight I was taken to Kentish Town Police Station and interrogated about the stories of a vampire I refused to give my name at first, I refused to give my address, I refused to name the other people, quite simply because they weren't doing anything wrong and the attitude of the police 
seem quite aggressive. They'd heard stories of vampires and all this sort of thing, and there's all the vandalism and desecration up there, so I wasn't going to bounce to name other people. And I also wanted to avoid bad publicity being attracted to the society. The officer, inspector in charge of the case, appreciated my concerns, told him I didn't believe in vampires, you were looking for the ghost there. And he made a deal with me, he said, look, if you just plead guilty in the morning at Clerkenwell Court, just plead guilty. Oh, I gave a false name deliberately. He accepted it, he said, plead guilty, you'll just get a technical war warning of trespass, the case will be over without any publicity, and that'll be the end of it. We've cleared the books, you can go. However, I kept my part of the bargain. When I got into court, I pleaded guilty. And this same pl police officer then said to the court, he was giving evidence, and he stood up and he said that after I pleaded guilty, he said that there'd been unlimited vandalism at Highgate Cemetery over the preceding months, serious vandalism, people have been breaking op open tombs, uh, looking for vampires, and most importantly of all, he said to, to the court that I'd said to him, you wouldn't understand, my intention was to seek out and stake the Highgate vampire. When I found it, I intended to rip a lid off a coffin, its coffin, and plunge my wooden stake through his heart. And he produced the wooden stake, minus the string. Now, I'd seen those items, I'd seen my camera, I'd seen my tape recorder and a few candles and a torch. I'd seen them on the desk at the police station. All they produced as evidence after I pleaded guilty was a cross and the stake. And if, because I pleaded guilty to it, all this was being believed. So I immediately changed my plea to not guilty. I gave the police my correct name and the court my correct name. And I was eventually given bail and I decided to go to court and fight the case. The important thing here is that when that statement was read out in court that was attributed to me that I did not make, the press were present and under its what is termed um, absolute privilege I believe, that's what is said in court can be reported in the newspaper without any fear of libel. This was reported and I became branded as a vampire hunter. Well, I never made that statement to the police in the first place, but that's how I became known as a vampire hunter. I went to court, I fought the case, explained it was a serious psychic investigation. I told the magistrate, oh, it went to court three times and it was adjourned, and one of the magistrates, funnily enough, was called Christopher Lee. <laughs> I often laugh, but it is really true. I fought the case, I said, look, it's just, I, I never said I was going to hunt vampires, we were looking for a psychic phenomenon. So, but in any event, it's just as akin to hunt vampires, as the police maintain, as it is for some people to spend vast sums of money trying to locate the Loch Ness Monster. The magistrate added that he was quite sat at the end, he said, that, well, it, he was quite satisfied, it was not my intention to damage coffins. Um, it would have been impossible to open the coffin anyway with just a small wooden stake. And... He said, in any event, the cemetery is not an enclosed legal area. And I was acquitted. Um, but I'd already been branded a vampire hunter. While all this pandemonium, pandemonium was going on, stories in the press, the psychic phenomena at Highgate Cemetery, more and more, not gradually, quite quickly, became some people trying to turn this entity, this spectre that I've seen, into a vampire. Um, <coughs> various, <coughs> various claims were made to the press. One particular person claimed that he'd actually entered Highgate Cemetery um, <coughs> in August 1970 uh, with some un <coughs> other unnamed people. They'd found They'd broken open one of the tombs, they'd removed the lid off a coffin, and he claimed that he'd actually saw the vampire asleep in the coffin with its mouth was still gorged with blood. He was about to stake it, or so he said, 
but he was talked out of it by the other people. And so he just performed an exorcism in the cemetery instead, which in the vault instead, which involved sprinkling, sprinkling around holy water and placing a few crosses here and there, and they sealed the tomb with garlic, impregnated cement, or so they said. Um, and only a couple of years later, the same group of people claimed that they, the vampire had now fled Highgate Cemetery because of all the interest in its activities. It had had enough. It wasn't safe there for it anymore, according to them anyway. It had taken up refuge in an old Gothic mansion in Crouch End. Uh, and this mansion had already been totally, not totally, partially gutted by fire. No one was living in it. They claimed that the vampire had, taken, had gone there, taken its coffin with it, and they claimed to have discovered it asleep in its coffin just after daybreak in the cellars of this old house. They then said they dragged the coffin out into the overgrown garden, um, and there they took some photographs of this vampire, and then the person claimed he drove his wooden stake through its heart, his story went on that the thing gave out an almighty roar, as if from the bowels of hell. I think that's an exact quote. And it, the vampire turned to a sluggish slime and reverser in the bottom of the casket. They then fetched a can of petrol from the car and incinerated it. Um, end of Highgate Vampire. That's if you believe it was a vampire. <laughs> but not an end of the Highgate ghost because these things don't actually work like that. Psychic energy can remain earthbound for decades, even centuries, and has nothing whatsoever to do with blood-sucking vampires to fake. That's why, quite honestly, I preferred investigations in, shall I say, my, my old days when we used, yes, we used night vision, but we used basically black and white cameras, when they were much more difficult to fake negatives and that sort of thing. I never, I've never personally faked any, any photographs, I didn't want to give that impression, but a lot of it has been done. I've seen films, videos on, on the TV, and I've been shown films privately, where you can actually see a moving image, and you would actually think it's a ghost, yeah. when it's just a fake. The, we're not in the business of faking, yeah. we're just trying to find the reality. Because of that very fact, that, that is all the faking which can go on, it's much harder to sometimes convince people if you do actually get a genuine photograph. Uh, I myself have one or two photographs only, um, which have, I can safely say, are unexplained. One was on a so-called haunted lake near Welling Garden City, which is only some 30 miles north of Muswell Hill. I've, I've often been asked by people, if we actually do find something out of a psychic nature, do we ever do anything about it? Now the simple answer to that I think is basic answer rather, is no, not usually. We're only concerned with trying to accumulate evidence and we don't really feel that there's any point in trying to interfere with something that's, well, almost natural or I know some people describe it as supernatural or preternatural. But the answer to that question would be basically no. We just want to acquire some evidence. Yes, there's one difficulty when trying to accumulate evidence, say that again, with trying to accumulate evidence, is that nowadays with all the modern technologies such as Photoshop and all the rest of them, Photographs are very, very easy. I, I came under my mother's influence a great deal. She taught me a lot about explain, not taught. She taught, she explained a lot about the spiritual world. Even our house was supposedly haunted. We used to hear an audible voice there in one of the big front rooms in, um, in Shepherd's Hill, Highgate. And on two or three occasions when I was very young, I actually glimpsed a figure in the corridor there 
and it was my mo it was my mother that explained to me that you shouldn't be frightened of these things. Sometimes they've got a na very natural explanation, even if it is a psychic one. And she 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 explained a lot about the nature of, if you like, ghosts, unexplained apparitions, the movement of objects, all the sort of things which would normally are or terrify a young child. And they did frighten me to a degree, but not after she explained their possible occurrence. I never attended the Spiritualist Church in Muswell Hill again. And we were spending a vigil on a very cold January night, and in the middle of the night, about half past three, rather in the morning, we distinctly saw a tall shape of, it appeared to resemble a lady, it looked to be about eight feet tall, in the middle of the lake, and it was floating across the water. Now, I had a photographer with me, and he immediately took a shot of it, but he didn't really have time to do much more, because this really only lasted for about three or four seconds, but we all distinctly saw it. Then it just, it vanished. Well, obviously, the first thing we we thought was, in the morning, we've got to investigate a bit more. Could it have been some sort of mist? Could it have been an underground pipe, maybe, of hot water, which is reacting with the lake? We didn't know, but we definitely got a picture of that white apparition. And when the negative was developed, it was entirely blank. All the other negatives that we'd taken in and around the or the manor house, because there was a manor house next to the lake, all the location shots were perfect. They all came out, but that particular place, uh, that particular negative was completely blank. So I'm afraid people would just have to draw their own conclusions from that. But that wasn't a fake. Yeah. I first became involved in, shall we say, the paranormal. Um, Many, many years ago, I was very young actually, I, I, I was 10, 11, and my mother was involved in the spiritualist church, and now she used to go to meetings locally, Muswell and Finchley, and it was also a place in Kentish Town. She used to attend spiritualist churches, and I think I was greatly influenced by her, because she had a very spiritual outlook to life. Well, but whereas my father was completely the opposite, he was a very, he was a good man, but he was very, uh, he didn't believe in the supernatural, he didn't even really believe in God, and this often caused a lot of conflict between them. Um, but basically I can say that I, 